In the headlines, relatives of the man first held for questioning in the murders of Joel and Isaiah Henry speak out for the first time. They say their life has been a living hell. The president said the promise of 50,000 house lots is not a wild one and says those who seek land must do the right thing. In Guyana, we have to get accustomed to doing things the right way. Vendors around Starbrook Market to be repositioned. And in sport, Burby synthetic tracks significantly behind time, but government committed to its completion, says Sport Minister. With the news, I'm Kurt Campbell. We're glad you can join us. First up, relatives of the man first held for questioning after the discovery of the mutilated bodies of Joel and Isaiah Henry on September 6 last say their lives have been a living hell ever since, despite the fact that the police has found no evidence to charge him. Family members say they have faced constant attacks and they live in fear daily. They say they want what everyone else wants. And that's for the police to find those who murdered the Henry boys and bring them to justice. In the face of the constant attacks against them, two of the relatives decided to come forward and tell their story to the newsroom's Neil Marks. We agreed to conceal their identities and to distort their voices. We were going about our normal lives and so unfortunate that the situation that happened in the area in which we live and ever since then it's been hell for our family first and foremost i would like to clear the air that we are innocent we do not know of anything concerning that matter all i know is that my relatives were being and followed to the station and they were interrogated and we have been targeted our families have become victims of something that we had no hand in, we do not know about. And it's been hell. The entire family is suffering. So, you say the bodies were found, the bodies of the Henry boys were found that Sunday afternoon. When were your relatives picked up? The very night. One was picked up and the next morning, another had a phone call to report to the station. Were they shocked at, that they were uh, being held for questioning? Yes. Why? Like I said, they were doing their normal everyday activity. They were working. And all, all of a sudden, out of the blue, that we heard the two boys were found there. And we didn't know anything about that until we followed up with the news from reading. That's how we know how the boys were killed and so on. You said that the particular lands where people say that these bodies were found are not, the location is not what people are saying it is. Help me understand that. They're claiming that the, some blood stains and coconut peelers and stuff were found on a coconut farm owned by our family and that's not true because we have other businesses, but not coconut farms. We don't deal with that. So where is that land in relation to, to yours? It's nearby. But your relatives never saw anyone on the land when all of this happened? They knew absolutely not. They didn't know that the boys were missing? No, we do not know them. And so just tell me some of the things that, um, that have been happening since then. But first of all, your relatives were cleared of, of these charges. No one is being held at this point in time. No, no, they're not being held. But the police continue to question them from time to time? Yes, they have to check in every now and then at the station. So they're still after us. Yeah. And the, during the protests and stuff, the protesters, they keep calling our names. Now how did that yeah. make you feel? This very tense situation and to hear that your name are being innocently called and you're being accused of something that you do not know about. It's, they're not words to describe how we're feeling. But we feel that we're being targeted and victimized. So what would you like to see happen? I would like, we want the same thing that everybody wants. We want the the real perpetrators, people that are responsible for this, to be found and punished. We do not want to be labeled as murderers or criminals or something that we had no hands in, we do not know about. We're 
make sense in all of this? Our lives has been turned upside down. We're faced with threats daily. Our, our lives, our properties, our workers, our businesses, everything. People who are affiliated with our lives are going to be threatened. We, um, you know, a few days back, a group of men went down to the back there where we're currently um, doing land preparation for rice and they attacked our driver, a tractor, and um, they fired shots at him. And you said that they had threatened to burn your house down or yes. Yes. attempted to? On the evening of when the boys' um, bodies were discovered, they showing a group of people, maybe about 20 of them, throwing um, flammable substance in the yard. They had to be, um, we had to have security, armed security at the property ever since. You said that you want to see the real killers of the Henry boys and Harish brought to justice. Yes. The thing is, in West Barbie says most of the guy I know was a very quiet, peaceful, you know, our crime rate. We didn't even have a crime rate in Barbies, and for the past, since, since the election, things have changed drastically on their, their, their rates. Pension is, is high more than ever. We've never had these kind of, of things happening. Young boys have been, you know, very traumatizing for Barbicians as a whole. I mean, to see little boys being killed so brutally, we all want the, the killers to be brought to the and they're not your relatives? No. no. If, if, if someone were to say that, you're just, you're just saying that because you, you know, just saying that so that the pr pressure would come off of you, what would you say to them? From day one, we have cooperated with the police. From day one, they went down without any warrants or so on to the police. They cooperated in any way whatsoever that was needed from us. We, you know, there's nothing that we have held. The lands that they're claiming these boys were found not our lands. So that's a whole that that was the basis of their arrest allegedly. Um, that is not being cleared up. So there was no other grounds for them to hold our family. Absolutely nothing. And now you like for it to stop? Yeah, of course. I mean, you can't go after. There were twenty something people arrested so far, to our knowledge. Yet there's still one family that is being targeted, based on the lives on Facebook. You would hear the family calling out specific names and so on. How is it that you're just going to call one name when you have arrested over twenty something people? And incidents have been happening daily. Yeah, and a few days back also, they said that they attacked our driver and tractor at the back dam. They went into other farmers, cash crop farmers. They raided their farms. But people are afraid. People are afraid to go and report these incidents in the fear of being victimized. Have you yourself tried to go back into the back dams? No. Why? I w we wouldn't want to put ourselves in unnecessary risk. It's yeah. a tense situation, and we do not. We you don't want to make it worse. And. So do you fear that people will do you something if you go? It's not fear, but it's just not putting yourself in a situation to make it worse. And I hate to bring it back, but you say that you haven't seen this sort of thing happen in, in your community before. Right. Yeah. No. You know, most of our workers are from number five. You know, we, we, have, we, are not, we're, we don't practice racism. We have a family of mixed people. So for them to make this about race and all these things, it was uncalled for. And so it's not just the immediate families of those who were arrested that has faced this kind of situation? No, farmers around the area. You know, Barbies is a primarily farming community. When these sort of things happening and there is no protection for innocent people, what happens then? People just leave their projects and they work so hard for There is no compensation whatsoever. We as a whole, we as farmers, we're large-scale rice farmers, cattle farmers. This has hampered our business. We have lost millions of dollars because of this incident. We're unable to travel as freely as we used to. The, the two weeks of unrest that they had in Barbies made it 
we could not have done any harvest and we, we had so many losses because of that. And this is not just one farmer. I mean, based on the news, you've seen trucks being born, other things, you know, it, 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 there's, and there's, the, the sad thing is there's no protection. There's no protection for the farmers. And what, what has the police been telling you? They're working on the case. They're, they're, they're leaving no stones. And does that satisfy you? No. Because I think if they won, if they had, they had done things in, in a different manner, they would have probably catched the perpetrators by now. Do you think they will? In a, in, a, in, a, in a case like that, somebody has to know something, you know. How is it? But this is a small place. You, something happens in, in a matter of minutes and hours, people hear about it. A crime so gruesome, how come nobody knows nothing about it? Are they looking in the wrong direction? We don't know. We hope and pray that they catch these killers and life can return to some sort of normalcy and justice can be served. Not just to the victims, but also to other victims who are grieving and, and suffering. Because to go through something like this, it really takes everything you have to pull yourself together and go on day to day. Still ahead on the newsroom, success squatters show up at the National Stadium to meet the president. You're watching the newsroom. Scores of squatters continue to resist removal from lands they occupy at Success East Coast Demerara. President Irfan Ali Friday said the government is committed to providing housing for all, but that those seeking lands must do it the right way. President Ali was speaking on Friday at the opening of a housing event at the National Stadium, where a number of those who have been squatting at Success attended the event. The president reminded that squatting is illegal and there is a process of acquiring housing. He said those squatters occupy lands belonging to the Ghana Sugar Corporation, Gaisuko, and cannot remain on those lands. He called on them to respond positively to the government's plan for relocation. The president, in responding to a request for squatters to remain on the land, said the government is only interested in developing communities that are sustainable. And on this note, let me say to my brothers and sisters in success, who we've reached out to on many occasions, it is not that we want you to be dislodged in the area. We want you to own your homes too. That is why we sent the housing team so many times to see you. But there is the right way in doing things and the wrong way. In Guyana, we have to get accustomed to doing things the right way. Otherwise, we'll be developing communities that are not sustainable. We want to help you. We're going to move as fast as possible in this program. But I'm appealing to Guyanese. Let us do it the right way. If you invest $5 million in a squatter settlement, there is no value because it cannot be used as, as collateral. If you invest it in a structural scheme, there is value. You can capitalize that sometimes for more than $5 million, $7 million, $8 million. The president was at the National Stadium where hundreds of Guyanese turned out to source assistance with home ownership at an event that Dream realized. Luana Fordyce, I've been waiting for the past 10 years, so I finally receive it. I want to give God praise and thanks for what he has done. President Irfan Ali Friday said the push towards 50,000 new house lots is not a wild promise, but it's a determined effort to ensure housing for all and his government will get it done. Ali reinforced his passion for housing development as he opened the two-day Dream Realize Housing Initiative at the National Stadium Providence. The former housing minister and president was involved in the handing over of the first set of over 350 titles and transports to citizens who have been waiting for years on those documents. Long lines and clusters of people characterized the scene outside the National Stadium where citizens waited in the mid-morning sun for an opportunity to meet with housing officials to either commence or move the process of home ownership forward. The President and Ministers of Housing and Water Colin Krull and Susan Rodriguez were also forced to meet with a large group of Rocca citizens who had to wait beyond the police barricade because of the large number of citizens who turned out to the event. So I have patience. Don't. What you all doing here is part to yourself. You all got to give yourself space. All right? Everybody, listen. All right, guys. All right. Everybody, you go and sit in the stand. 
Just sit apart from each other. What you're doing here is bad for yourself. I'm telling you, you're exposing yourself to death. You all follow the COVID restriction. Why are you doing this? Go and sit in the stand. The ministers will see every single person. And let me tell you, it is 50,000 last three developing. Right? So everybody go to the stand. Everybody will be served. Okay? Also participating in the initiative were several commercial banks, insurance companies, service providers, contractors and developers, among others. President Irfan Ali, in outlining the government's vision for housing, said the government is not merely looking to provide house lots, but also to build homes and strengthen families. The president said the promises are not only of access to housing, but also one of affordability and one where citizens will benefit from a modern network of infrastructure. We're talking about dreams and making dreams reality. Dreams without action remains a dream. You can have the greatest dream, but if you don't take action on that dream, it remains a dream. The president said the banking sector must also get it right in ensuring that citizens benefit from incentives handed down by the government. He also asked banks to work with the government in ensuring that homeowners benefit from pre-qualified loans. He talked up a new push to ensure zoning of activities. The president reminded of his promise to deliver 50,000 house lots in the next five years, with 5,000 of those lots likely to be ready and available for distribution by November 2020. The initiative, which started on Friday, will end on Saturday, but not before persons are assisted with land applications and queries about the process. In addition to housing services, the event also saw the attendance of service providers such as e-networks offering a range of services to homeowners. All right, so for everyone who knows me in bed, I'm the customer experience manager at e-networks, and we are here to give services and provide better connection to everyone, wherever you are, we have a service for you. So we're launching right now our 4G and 5G services, which gives you better connection, better speed, and great reliability. The Ministry of Public Health on Friday reported two new COVID-19 deaths, bringing the overall total to 109. The, last, the latest fatalities were a 48-year-old man from Region 1 and a 71-year-old woman from Region 4. They both died while receiving care at a medical facility. All Guyanese are reminded to observe the protocols of the COVID-19 emergency measures number 9, which are in effect until October 31, 2020. This order emphasizes the need for correct and consistent use of a face mask when leaving your home, the importance of maintaining the six feet physical distance from others, and the need for good hand hygiene to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Minister of Public Works Juan Edgel and Minister of Home Affairs Roops and Ben on Friday inspected activities around Starbrook Market and determined that vendors around the area should be repositioned to allow for the smooth flow of vehicles and pedestrians. It was announced also that the City Fire Service Department will begin washing of the tarmacs and bus parks over the weekend in the vicinity of the Starbrook Market, while the Ministry of Public Works will commence patching of the roads and painting clear demarcation lines for bus lanes and travel lanes. We've had a walk around of the uh, Starbrook Market area and of the minibus ranks uh, to have an underground assessment of the situation and to set the basis for the gathering of more data for the meeting with the leaders, the heads of each route operator and to move forward a discussion which will see improvements both hopefully from the uh, city council end, from the Ministry of Public Works and also from the Ministry of Home Affairs. I think we all know that the situation around this area is precarious, is congested and dangerous. And that we have to try again, I would say I've tried before, to bring a reasonable situation here with respect to traffic flow and the safety of persons traversing the area. So this is the beginning of another effort from the point of view of the Ministry of Home Affairs the Ministry of uh, Public Works, of course the police traffic chief is here, and the commander for the division, George Dung, here, so that we could strategically bring an improvement in this area. 
sometime next week, by Wednesday, I'm hoping, we'll be able to bring together the different actors and the stakeholders too, to have a discussion, an open discussion as to ideas as to what we ought to do. Hopefully, out of that meeting, we'll have an agreement for moving forward so that we could bring about a better situation. So I'm open to questions now. This when you, you made, um, you walked around the market area also. What was the observation made and suggestions? Well, we are not, we are not happy, of course, with a lot of selling that is going on the roadway, which should be open to traffic and to the fire service uh, assets, the fire trucks and the ambulances. So that's very difficult situation. At the moment, we are requesting, requiring that the persons who are selling on the traffic roadway to move off of the roadway and to try with the uh, public works people to rationalize where we can the bus, the lane arrangements. Minister, for years, suggestions were made to um, relocate the fire station. Um, is there any maybe plans for that? Uh, you're looking at There's that? no plan that I am aware of in my view and it might be thought of as a personal view. All the historical fires in Georgetown have happened in this circular area. And if we have an ambitious burden of moving the fire service trucks too far out, every minute comes when there is a fire. So what we want to do is to ride back the fire lanes on the ground, on the roadways, to have people move off so that there is free access, free departure lanes for the fire trucks and the ambulances, and to try to maintain that. Well, I am leery of moving the fire service out of central Georgetown, if you look at all the fires from 4 to 5 in the 60s, and the intermittent fires in the business district. The business district is focused here, and um, I don't think it is a good idea, but I've been criticized that it's not necessarily the best approach, but it's one that we're looking More news ahead. Stay with us. Mark, you're watching the newsroom. The governments of Guyana and Suriname have set up a technical team which is looking at financing of the Currentine River Bridge, according to Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, New Tud. During an interview on the sidelines of an event on Friday, the minister said other aspects of the arrangement are yet to be sorted out. With what we're doing right now, we're focusing on the technical um, specs, we're looking at financing, and we want to be able to, to figure out which is the best model to use. Um, and we haven't discussed um, jurisdiction. We haven't done that as yet. As it comes to financing, who are you responsible for borrowing and repairment? Well, we have a technical team that we've um, established, and they will look at, at financing on either side because we want to have a partnership arrangement with the government of Suriname. On our side, will it be a more government approach or a private sector involved? Well, it all depends. In small economies, usually uh, governments usually get involved in big projects. Um, it's not something that we want to do, but uh, we have to explore the, the possibilities. It could be a private um, initiative, it can be a public-private initiative. The French government has donated U.S. $2 million in emergency aid to indigenous communities in the Amazon region. And Guyana will get $200,000. The immediate objectives are to provide humanitarian support, food relief, medication, sanitization supplies, and to reinforce awareness and preventing the spread of the virus. The Amerindian People's Association has been chosen to coordinate and implement the French financial assistance in 88 indigenous communities. According to the embassy, when the COVID-19 crisis hit Guyana, the APA raised concerns for indigenous communities that are isolated and experienced limited access to health care services. Businessman Robert Badal is calling on the APA and UAFC opposition and the governing People's Progressive Party to find a way to work together. But importantly, he wants the coalition opposition to recognize the PPP government as legitimately elected. 
Almost a decade after endorsing the Alliance for Change and later going on to become a supporter of the APNU AFC coalition, businessman Robert Badal wants the coalition to set aside its rivalry with the governing People's Progressive Party in the interest of national development. Badal's comments come months after he formed and led the Change Guyana political party into the March 2020 elections as a political opponent to both the governing and opposition parties. But he believes that with the elections now over and the government installed, that competition for power should now be set aside. So that election is one, one time when you compete. After elections, you should put your hands together and support because the objectives are the same. The personalities are different, but we set out to achieve the same thing. So I would want, I would like to see the two main parties um, come together and work together and move away from the hostile politics that has destroyed this country since elections. You know, we hear about a PPP government and an APNU government. It's the one government, it's the government of Guyana. And once the government is democratically elected in a free process, a free and credible process, that's the government of Guyana. And APNU has to respect that. Badal recognizes the PPP as the democratically elected government through a free and credible process and called on the coalition to respect that too. The APNU AFC has filed two elections petitions in the High Court challenging the credibility of the March 2, 2020 elections. Those elections removed the coalition from the seat of government with President Afrin Ali refusing to engage the APNU AFC as opposition given its insistence that he won the elections by fraudulent means and as a consequence was illegitimately elected. Badal, who had contested the elections as a challenge to failed leadership, believes that it is time to put grievances and competition for power behind. He has put forward recommendations for a long-term development plan for the country. So I would really like to see the two major parties work together and, 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 and put your, you know, their grievances and um, you know, competition for power behind. Because at the end of the day, the objectives ought to be the same, you see? I would also like to see that what has never happened in this country is a long-term development plan where both parties have an input into, from the leadership of the president to create a long-term development plan that both parties um, ascribe to. Both parties support a development plan that's legislated in Parliament so that whoever gets into government, there's no change in the direction of the The Pegasus Hotel owner said he was engaged by both President Irfan Ali and Vice President Bar Jagdio and believes that their outreaches to the small parties are timely. It is in this vein that he believes that the role of small parties have now become crucial to encourage that inclusivity. Kurt Campbell. Newsroom. The government of Guyana is looking to use its chairmanship of the G77 group to reverse the damage done to the country's image before, during and after the 2020 general and regional elections. Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Utah, on Friday launched a flagship event which will be addressed by President Irfan Ali as chairman of the group of 134 countries later this month. Todd said it is important to restore Guyana as an equal partner globally. Guyana assumed chairmanship of the G77 group of 134 countries in January. The group is designed to create an enhanced joint negotiating capacity in the United Nations. With just over two months remaining to its tenure, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, UTOD, said it is important that Guyana is returned to its rightful place in the global environment. He was at the time referring to the deterioration of the country's image in the region and globally following the 2018 no-confidence motion and the five-month-long electoral process earlier this year. When we were participating at this level, at the multilateral level, um, you, you put your country on the map. You're able to insert your country better in the global environment. And it's important for branding and our country image. Um, recall we've came out of a very difficult period um, from 2018 to 2020. And we've lost a lot of um, capital, um, and we, we're regaining it slowly. 
um, or I should say rapidly based on the influx in our, on our communications and our dialogue with international partners and friends. So what you will find happening is that Rihanna, Rihanna's uh, profile would would be restored um, as an equal partner um, globally. He said Guyana was shut out of global engagements for some time and it is important to be able to return to those platforms. Todd on Friday launched a flagship event for Guyana's chairmanship, a virtual forum to be held on October 29th and 30th under the theme Maintaining Low Carbon Development Path Towards the 2030 Agenda in the Era of COVID-19. He said the government's low carbon development strategy will be shown to the wider world as a model to tackle climate change. We are providing leadership for about 130 countries. This is a small state. We have our challenges, we have our vulnerabilities, uh, but with the leadership being provided at, le at the level of the head of state, uh, our president, um, Dr. Irfan Ali, we are confident that we'll be able to make a lasting impression the two-day event will feature two sessions daily. Topics on the agenda include framing the discourse, climate ambition and climate finance, COVID-19 experiences, lessons for combating climate change and ecosystem-based approaches to climate change. Bibi Katoon, Newsroom. When the Newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sports. It's being done in phases, so after this is done, you've got to asphalt it, you've got to do some backfilling. So it's quite a bit more work to be done, even though, you know, it looks as though, um, you know, it's gone a far way. It's quite a bit more work to be done. But when it's done, it's going to be a very good um, international uh, synthetic track. This will be able to help to propel athletes into a position of being world-class, having good access to world-class facilities, which is important for me in terms of my ministry. It's important to the president. Um, and it's also important to the country because every single time that a, a young athlete stands at, in, in any podium, uh, podium they're singing the national anthem for Guyana. That's something that, and they're flying that flag. That's something that we all have to be proud of. However, as the government, we have to make sure that we have value for money too. We have to make sure that, that there isn't a lot of leakage um, for money going in different directions and projects not being completed on time. So even though we haven't been aggressive um, in terms of knowing uh, getting to the bottom of these types of projects, it is something that needs to be done from the point of view of accounting to the people what has been spent, what needs to be spent, how quickly can it be done, how long are you uh, behind time. So that's in relation to this. Cricket News Now, Cricket West Indies on Friday announced the two squads for the proposed tour of New Zealand, which will feature three T20 internationals and two test matches from November 27 to December 15. The test squad sees the return of three players who missed the series against England earlier this year. Details of the tour were ratified by Cricket West Indies Board of Directors during a teleconference on Thursday. The board agreed to tour in principle, subject to final details on medical and logistical protocols of Cricket West Indies, New Zealand cricket and the government of New Zealand. In the test squad, there is a return for left-handed batsmen Darren Bravo and Shimron Hetmeyer, as well as the all-rounder Kimo Paul. Bravo's highest test score of 218 came at the University Oval in Dunedin in 2013. A group of reserves will also travel to help prepare the test squad during the quarantine period and training camp, as well as cover for injuries. Andre Fletcher, the experienced wicketkeeper batsman, has been named in the T20 squad for the first time since 2018. There is a maiden call-up in this format for Kyle Mayers, the all-rounder who performed well in last month's Caribbean Premier League. All-rounder Andre Russell and top-order batsmen Lyndall Simmons and Evan Lewis have opted not to participate in the tour. 
CWI fully respects their decision to choose to do so and states that this will not impact consideration for future selection. The Cricket West Indies selection panel indicated this upcoming series will form part of the overall planning towards defending the ICC World T20 title. The panel also outlined that they will continue to monitor closely the progress of spin bowler Sunil Narain and all other players in the lead-up to the global event. The test squad reads Jason Holder captain, Jermaine Blackwood, Craig Braffitt, Darren Bravo, Shamar Brooks, John Campbell, Rustin Chase, Rakeem Cornwall, Shane Dowrich, Shannon Gabriel, Shimron Hetmeyer, Shamar Holder, Alzari Joseph, Kimo Paul and Kimar Roach. The reserves are Enkrumah Bonner, Joshua De Silva, Preston Maxween, Shane Mosley, Raymond Rufa and Jaden Seals. The T20 squad reads Kieran Pollard captain, Fabian Allen, Dwayne Bravo, Sheldon Cottrell, Andre Fletcher, Shimron Hetmeyer, Brandon King, Kyle Mears, Rothman Powell, Kimo Paul, Nicholas Puran, O'Shea Thomas, Hayden Walsh Jr. and Keswick Williams. And though they were overlooked for the upcoming tour to New Zealand, Cricket West Indies Chief Selector Roger Harper has indicated that the door is not closed on the experienced pair Chris Gale and Sunil Narain. At a virtual press briefing on Friday, Harper indicated that both are still being considered. Akim Green reports. Gale last played at the 20th International for West Indies in March 2019 and has missed the next five series after, while Narayan has played during the India visit in August 2019 and was absent for the next four series. However, the two T20 greats have played over 750 T20 matches combined, which is a world of experience for any side. Gale did not feature in this year's Caribbean Premier League and now 4-1, to the big question mark is on how much more time he has remaining in the maroon colours. For now, Harper said he is in consideration for selection. Chris Gale, like Son and Narang and all that, everyone is being considered, you know. We picked a squad that, you know, we thought was the right one for this tour. We looked at when we, the comments were made based on the players who were in the last tour and were either not in the squad you know, our new players who have come into the squad. But um, again, Chris Gale, like Son and Narang, is a world-class player. We know what he's capable of. So going forward, he will be considered and is being considered and will be considered going forward as well. Narang's current situation is less in straightforward than Gale's since he was reported for bowling with a suspected illegal bowling action during Calcutta's Knight Riders match against Kings XI Punjab last Saturday in the ongoing Indian Premier League. He has missed the next two matches for KKR, but has understood he's been working with Englishman Carl Crow, the man who helped him in 2014, to rectify his action. Harper said that once Narayan is confident in his ability and ready to return to a Sydney setup, he will be considered. Sonnel is an experienced player. We all know what Sonnel is capable of. He's a world-class performer. I think that um, he understands the process of getting through these challenges because uh, you know he's done it in the past. And we know what Sonnel can do as we build up to the T20 World Cup when the, you know, Sonnel is ready and, and available, fully fit, and everything is in sync. You know, he'll be considered. You don't need much um, analysis or assessment of Sonnel Narang's um, form or quality. We know what he's capable of. So once available and everything is in order, as we move forward, you know, we will look at him and see whether we need you know, if he's available and ready to be drafted into the squad. The other thing is this gives the, us the opportunity to have a look at some other players and see how the whole car, the different combinations and compositions work out and what really works best for us. So um, it's not that, um, you know, we're not looking at, the, at a player like Son and Narang because of his natural match winning qualities. We, we can't take our eyes off of him, but, you know, everyone is being considered. It was indicated that this upcoming three-match series will form part of the overall planning towards defending the ICC World T20 title in India 2021. For the newsroom, Akim Green. And Shimron Hetmeyer is seen by many as the future of West Indies batting and the chief selector Roger Harper has endorsed the young talent, noting that he has the pedigree to be the best in the world. Here again is Akim Green. The 23 old has returned to the West Indies test squad after missing the earlier tour to England due to safety concerns. Speaking at a virtual press briefing on Friday, Harper indicated once Hetmeyer can understand how to maximize his potential, he has the ability to be the best in the world. Having missed the tour, he's hungry to get back and anxious to show 
what a quality player he is in all formats of the game, and especially in Test cricket. I personally think that that Hetmeyer has the ability to be one of the best batsmen in the world, you know, in Test cricket as well, you know. And um, as he gets un to understand the rhythm of Test cricket and, uh, and the approach needed, I think he'll he'll show that. So this is an opportunity for him to showcase his skill and talent, and like I said, help to build help the team to build big totals. Those return may not coincide with immediate presence in the playing 11 since his number six competitor, Jermaine Blackwood, performed credibly in England. He offers a team great depth and quality options. Shemron Hetmeyer, we know he's a very talented player. I think he gives us a lot more depth in quality and um, in, a, in ability in that middle order. So we, we're hoping that he'll be able to seize this opportunity to showcase just how good a player he is. Finally, some IPL news. Mumbai Indians have gone top of the table in the IPL, comfortably beating Kolkata Knight Riders in match 32 on Friday in Abu Dhabi. Chasing 149, Mumbai coasted to victory at 149 for two in 16.5 overs on the back of an opening stand of 94 in 10.3 overs between skipper Rohit Sharma and Quinton de Kock. Sharma cracked 35, but de Kock stayed to the end, hitting 78 not out of 44 balls with nine fours and three sixes. Hardik Pandya finished the game in a flurry, hitting three fours and a six in 21 not out. Earlier, Kolkata Knight Riders on the new skipper Aaron Morgan slipped to 61 for 5 at the halfway stage and it took an unbroken partnership of 87 between Morgan and Pat Cummings to give them a respectable score of 148 for 5. Cummings struck uh, 5 fours and 2 sixes and 53 of 36, while Morgan was not out on 39 when the innings ended. Bowling for Mumbai, Rahul Chahar had 2 for 18, while there was 1 each for Trent Bolt, Nathan Colton Nile and Jasprit Bumra. IPL action continues tomorrow and it's a double header starting with Rajasthan Royals versus Royal Challengers Bangalore at 6 hours and Delhi Capitals against Chennai Super Kings at 10 hours. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. My name is Avinash Ramdan. Thanks for watching. Have a safe weekend.